It's it's 301. Um, welcome everybody to this month's interoperability, ESIP interoperability and technology tech dive webinar. As uh, this is the you're looking at the page uh, that describes all the previous talks that we've had in this in this webinar series. And each of these talks is recording. We're re recording this talk now. If you're here for the first time, welcome. Uh, if you got a if you got here by tweet or by forwarded email, you can sign up for getting notified about these uh, ESIP uh, webinars by, if you just actually Google on ESIP um, Tech Dive, you'll end up at this uh, page here where you can go and join this uh, email list. And we'll, we'll also, uh, we'll chat this, we'll put this in the chat. Okay, um, so we've been on sort of a theme this uh, probably the past year or so, a lot on Jupyter Hub um, and uh, associated um, sort of processing on the cloud and um, and other technologies uh, related to Jupiter, and so we're really pleased today to have Tim Crone from Lamont talking about his work using the Pangeo framework to look at an uh, underwater video in the cloud. So I think we're just going to Tim. I'm just going to turn it over to you. I'm going to make you the presenter, and you should be able to share your screen. Looking good. Great. Thanks, Rich. And uh, thank you, everyone, for coming and uh, attending this talk today. So I'm going to talk about um, analyzing a very large scale uh, video data that we have from the OI uh, cabled array in the cloud using Pangeo. Um, so I want to start off uh, with an outline here. Um, I'll talk about the OI, uh, the CAMHD data from the cabled array. I'll talk about PyCam HD, which is a, a, a library that um, we built in order to um, work with these data um, a little bit more efficiently than just downloading the movie files. I'll talk about Pangeo, which is a platform for doing big data science in the cloud, which and we'll, uh, which we'll be working on today. And then hope, um, hopefully um, I can zip through that really flat fast so that I can get to some live demos. I want to do a, a couple of really simple live demos uh, showing how PyCam HD works showing some demos with IPy widgets and the, the, the full scale um, uh, data set. And then we'll um, hopefully spend most of our time on looking at a notebook that uses DAS delayed um, uh, functionality and distributed and the distributed scheduler um, to analyze a bunch of these data. So the IOI CAM HD data um, is uh, a, a data set that's being delivered live from the seafloor from the Ocean Observatories Initiative. This is a big NSF program funded by NSF, um, you know, and a lot of people are involved, people from APL, University of Washington, uh, Ocean Leadership Runners, on and on. There's so many people that are uh, cr critical for making this system work. They're doing a fantastic job. They're delivering a lot of data. And there's too many of them to mention, but we owe them a debt of gratitude for all the work that they do to get these data back to us, uh, oftentimes, most of the time, live. Um, and they're about to go uh, out to sea to switch out all the instruments on the cable ring. So we want to wish them the best of luck. So if you don't know about the Ocean Observatories Initiative cable array system, um, it looks like this. Can you see my, uh, my cursor here? Yes. OK. So this is the this is the Neptune Canada system. This is a different system, but it's similar. This is the United States system. This is the Ocean Observatory's cabled array system. It's about 800 kilometer uh, fiber optic and copper cable that delivers uh, power and data very high da data bandwidth to hundreds of instruments that are connected to it um, uh, in the on, in the shelf uh, and slope environments, in the mid plate environment, and all the way out to uh, the the Juan de Fuca Ridge and uh, Axial Seamount, which is a submarine um, volcano uh, on that mid-ocean ridge. Zooming into uh, Axial Caldera, where the instrument is that we're going to be talking about today, there are a number of uh, primary, well, there's one primary node for Axial Caldera and, and a number of, uh, of secondary nodes. And from, from the secondary nodes, a whole host of instruments are connected to this cabled observatory. They're all um, delivering their data 
in real time to the internet and uh, all these data are free and open for all scientists to use across the, across the globe. Anyone who wants to use these data can. Here at the ashes event field, there's a few instruments, including an HD video camera. And this HD video camera turns on every uh, three hours and collects a large amount of data. And uh, those video data are what we're going to talk about today. Here's a picture of the camera system. It's on the seafloor here um, uh, with a pan and tilt. And it sits in front of this vent structure. So this is a hydrothermal vent called mushroom. And every, day, every three hours, it turns on and kind of does a little survey of the vent. And I'll show you some video of that, uh, of, of that now. So here is an example video of, from this from the system. This is sped up by four times so that you can kind of get a sense for um, what it's looking at. Every time that it turns on, it more or less does the same routine. It looks here, then it looks there, then it zooms back and looks over here and looks over there. Um, and it collects, you know, 30 seconds to 60 seconds of each different uh, scene that it goes through as it goes uh, through its routine. The video is, uh, uh, can be very, very high quality. There's a lot of really interesting science that can be done with this video uh, data. What is the resolution of that? I guess you're going to tell us, but. Yeah, it's an HD video camera, so it's 1920 by 1080. Okay. Um, so this is really big data. These uh, these files are collected uh, every three hours. Although the, the camera system is uh, is offline right now, it's going to be replaced during the upcoming uh, replacement cruise, I think in July. Um, but uh, every uh, uh, it collects it collects uh, uh, MOV files that are stored basically just on a web server that look that looks like this. So every single video is in here on the raw data archive. Um, there are 8,000 currently 8,428 videos, the ProRes encoded MOV files. They're about 15 gigabytes each. So unless you have a really, really fast pipe, you, it's probably going to take, um, you know, could take an hour or two to download each of these videos. Um, and that can be a problem for people doing very large um, analyses across, uh, across a, um, long periods of time. We'll talk about how to deal with that. Um, in terms of just images alone, there's 227 HD image, 227 um, HD images. And the data set totals approximately 90 terabytes. So, you know, it can take a couple, three, four weeks to download these data if you want to download all of them. We don't recommend that you do this. There's better ways to do this. Anyways, there's all kinds of really interesting science to do with these with this data set. There's geological problems contained in this video data. There's oceanographic problems and biological problems in the in the water column. There's macrofaunal problems that people who are, might be interested in doing analyses of of time series analyses of tube worms or or limpets. Uh, you know, there's there's just it's an unbelievable amount of scientific opportunities to understand how hydrothermal systems work on a variety of levels within these data, but we have to come up with efficient, fast ways of doing uh, image analyses on these data. And so one of the things that uh, we built is a thing called uh, PyCam HD, which is a, a Python library for working with this, uh, with these data. Um, it's, it's PIP installable. And what it what it offers is the ability to extract individual images from the MOV files. Uh, it returns images from the MOV files just by giving it a file name and the frame number. Uh, it returns images as uh, NumPy arrays. Um, it has um, functions for getting information about the file, such as the number of uh, such as the number of frames, the 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 actual time that the that the file was created. Uh, and information about the entire archive as well. So this is um, also something that's worth taking a look at. I have um, a GitHub repository for PyCam HD that's relatively um, with some relatively decent um, documentation on how to on how to use PyCam HD. We'll 
we'll run through some basics of how to use it using basically Git frame, which is one of the kind of key um, uh, functionalities. Tim, Tim, what fraction of the um, OOI data is, you know, volume is this, uh, is the uh, video data? Is, that, is it like 90% or 50%, 10%? Probably sort of on the uh, around maybe 40 or 50 percent. There's there's one other um, system that creates a very large amount of data, and that's the hydrophone system. And those create data sets. Those have those are data sets that are sort of about on the same um, uh, approximate amount. But then then there's all the rest of the data from the from the cable array. Okay. So. I don't think there's any other instruments on the array that are creating anywhere near this amount of data. Yeah. I don't know. There's, there's people on the call. Let's see if, if, if Friedrich's on the call, he can probably tell us, but there, the, um, yeah, I'm going to guess something like 40% of the yeah, data okay. total. All right. So let's move on. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, Sorry, repeat the question. What was it again that Rich you were you were asking? Well, I was just I was just asking sort of what fraction of the overall OI data. I mean, this is basically Tim. I mean, the answer is it's a big, it's a huge chunk, right? That, <laughs> yeah, by far, yeah. ChemHD takes up most of the OI data. Yep. Yep. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, so let's move on to the Pangeo project, which I want to talk about, which we're going to use later uh, in this talk. Um, the Pangeo project is basically uh, a, a community-driven effort to build a cloud-based environment, uh, a, a sort of platform for doing big Earth data analysis built on a bunch of Python tools, including Jupyter, Dask, X-Array, Kubernetes. Um, it's a collaborative effort and involves a lot of people, some of the people who are, who are core to the Programmer Ryan Abernathy from Lamont, Joe and Kevin from NCAR, and R Matt Rockman from Anaconda, but very large numbers of people from all over, all over the world have, uh, have have joined up and gotten involved, including including Rich, several people from the Met Office, NASA, um, people at Berkeley, who've uh, contributed to the Pangeo project. It's uh, starting to look like something that um, a lot of people are um, beginning to get really interested in. What is it? Well, it's really um, an effort to sort of put together a bunch of the pieces of the scientific Python data uh, stack um, to work for data science. And specifically, um, Pangeo uh, is focused on um, using three components in particular, although there's a lot of other parts to this thing. One of them is Dask, uh, which we'll talk a lot about today and we'll use a lot today. Um, X-Array, which is another important component of this, which we'll um, not really be using in this talk, but I'll talk briefly about it. Jupyter, which you probably all know about, of course, of course things like Python and NumPy. So X-Array, if you don't know already, is a, is a really cool library for um, doing multidimensional, um, um, basically storing multidimensional variables with coordinates, metadata, labeled uh, arrays, uh, it's sort of like, I mean, here it says NetCDF meets pandas. I'd say that it, it's sort of like pandas data frames meets NumPy arrays um, plus NetCDF since it can do lazy loading of, of data. This is a really cool library, and Geo makes a very um, uh, heavy use of X-Array in a lot of cases. Um, we, we're not going to be using it very much today. We are going to be using Dask, which I call a simplified um, parallel and processing system inside of, inside of Python. Um, Dask in part is uh, an extension to NumPy arrays, so that so there are Dask arrays and Dask arrays are, are chunked, uh, so that Dask can compute on the chunks separately, rather than having to load an entire uh, array into memory. If you have a very very large array that cannot be um, cannot be held in memory, um, but also Dask um, presents um, a technique uh, for um, for uh, defining programs, essentially, 
that can be uh, worked on um, that can work on chunks of the of the dask arrays and can be farmed out to processors or workers in the cloud um, and uh, so dask sort of uh, offers the opportunity to kind of represent programs as dictionaries that are um, that can be scheduled by a scheduler across cpus across processors and across nodes in a in a in a hpc or a cloud environment uh, and so it offers a relatively low cost to entry way of parallelizing your code if you're not using dask in your python code you probably should be because even if you're just doing some stuff that takes a little you know more than a minute or two on your computer on your laptop that has you know four maybe even eight cores you can use dask to basically use to use all your cores very very efficiently and, and without a, a huge amount of work um, dask also has uh, this um, um, uh, a module called delayed which allows the the lazy loading of chunks so those chunks are not uh, pulled into memory until they're required dask delayed kind of defines another um, part of the program that can tell that tells dask how that chunk can be obtained in some cases and we're going to be doing a lot of work with dask delayed and we're going to be doing a lot of work with the distributed scheduler um, momentarily so this is a, a graphic that kind of shows the pangeo architecture uh, generally speaking uh, dask and x-ray sitting at the core with a very uh, uh, if efficient and um, easy methods of interacting with distributed storage systems in the cloud uh, and Jupyter serving as the front-facing side of the system so that users can interact with a, a cloud cluster or an HPC cluster uh, over the web and don't have to download very, very large data sets. Pangeo has been deployed on uh, a lot of different systems. I've deployed it on Microsoft Azure, so we'll be looking at that uh, today. Uh, people at the Met Office are using uh, Amazon. The, the what you might call the official Pangeo is on Google Cloud, and many people have uh, have deployed Pangeo on HPC systems, HPC systems such as Cheyenne, Pleiades. Um, it's very it's 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 very easy to deploy a Pan, a Pangeo on your environment if you want to deploy one. So this is an important slide, I think, how to get involved. So Pangeo dot uh, Pangeo data dot org is the main website for Pangeo. Um, there are lots of different Pangeo deployments that are out there that you can use. The, the official one at pangeo.pydata.org. Anybody can log into this thing and start using uh, Pangeo in the cloud. And uh, you know you can start firing off uh, dozens of workers and do really cool research um, using Pangeo today. Um, there's a GitHub page, obviously, with um, where where we have a lot of our conversations. So you know I, I encourage everyone if they haven't already. Uh, gotten involved to kind of plug in and participate. Okay, so we're running right on time. Um, now I thought we would switch over to the live demo so we can switch over to my Pangeo, to, uh, my Pangeo system that's on Azure and we can run through a couple of, uh, of examples that I think will be really fun to, to check out. Let's put that. Here's Pangeo's web webpage. It's very pretty, in my opinion. I think they've done a very nice job. There's a lot of deployments here, um, which you can take a look at. And a lot of these people who have made, who've put in a ton of work to get this thing to work on different systems will answer your questions if you want to deploy a system um, on uh, for, your, for yourself. And here is the RTE CAMHD repository, which is um, what we're going to be working with um, today. So uh, my RT CAMHD uh, repo uh, under Tim has all of today's examples. We're going to be working with, um, we're going to be looking at PyCAMHD notebook, we're going to be looking at the image sliders notebook, and we're going to be looking at the flock notebook. Okay. All right, so back over here. Big enough? Yep, looking good. All right, so the first two notebooks are super simple um, and just give you an idea of how certain things 
uh, certain components work. So this notebook, the PyCam HD notebook, just shows a basic example of how to use the PyCam HD library, um, specifically the get frame uh, method, which is the kind of the core of the whole thing. So, like I said, this is pip installable, thanks uh, in part to Friedrich, who helped me uh, get it pip installable. So you can install PyCam HD with pip. And then you can import it. Normally, I import it as KMHD, and then uh, it also needs NumPy to run. And so the way it works is, uh, in order to load a frame from one of the videos, you have to define a frame, uh, a file name. So here's a file name. It's a you know, it's just basically the entire URL for a particular file. We'll choose a frame number, kind of at random here, 4,000, and then we'll go ahead and get a frame passing in the file name, passing in the frame number, and passing in the the uh, the color space that we want to have um, come back. We can bring back RGB 24s. We can bring back 48-bit um, RGBs. We can bring back 8-bit uh, grayscales, 16-bit grayscales. So Oftentimes Tim, for most part. Go ahead. Yeah, so Tim, um, there's there was a question in the chat uh, about how you know much does it cost to save 90 terabytes of data uh, in the cloud, but you're not, the data is not in the cloud here. You're loading it from the um, raw data uh, repository. It, it, why are you, are you loading it there just because it's too expensive to have in the cloud or it doesn't make that much difference in performance or? Well, what we found is that the raw data archive web server is actually pretty good at serving uh, data pretty fast. Now, is it going to be as fast as if it was, say, in the Google Cloud or in the Azure, um, you know, as a as a um, as a blob in one of these uh, uh, cloud systems? I I don't I don't think so, but it is it would be quite expensive, th many many thousands of dollars a month to store 90 terabytes in the cloud. So uh, while we kind of were playing around for a while with caching data in blob storage or you know, moving some of the data into, um, into cloud storage, either on Google or on um, Azure, um, we found that the, this, the raw data archive server, which is at, which is at Rutgers, um, is pretty has a pretty fat pipe and can serve the data pretty fast. And we'll 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 um, we'll get some some sense for that later when we start processing lots of the video data. Okay. Um, so, you know, I don't have the money. You know, personally, don't have the money to store this in the cloud. I mean, the quote unquote the commercial cloud. Um, and you know, it might be a good idea to do that in the future. Uh, I think it would be a good idea to get one of these cloud cloud um, providers to to uh, you know to to donate uh, space on their system in, in order to allow people to to come and compute on it in the cloud. But at the moment, we're going to be working off of this web server that's that resides uh, in New Jersey. Okay, thanks. And is, and is funded by the Ocean Observatories um, initiative. Okay, so we'll just run get frame and we'll show what the frame shape is, right? It's going to be, oops, we have to run that first. Um, it's going to be an HD image. It's a NumPy array. It's 1080 by 1920 and by three because we're going to get, because we got an RGB 24 um, image. And we'll just show what the image looks like by plotting it using matplotlib. No big deal. Nothing fancy there. But here what we've done is very quickly extracted a single image out of uh, a single movie file. Um, so you can see the potential power in being able to do this. Um, you can write a frame to a PNG. We're not going to do that because that's not that exciting and there's lots of different tools to do that. But anyways, um, let's move on to the next example here. So this is kind of a fun um, notebook to show because this is an example of using IPy widgets to give essentially users access to every single image in the entire database, right? So all 200 and whatever 27 million images can be can be um, you know explored and looked at using a couple, two just two sliders in uh, in 
a Python, uh, in our Jupyter notebook. So we'll load up some uh, some some uh, libraries. Um, I have a um, I have a database in a JSON uh, file that has a list of every single one of the uh, files that are available on the server. And um, it also has some other information about each one of those files. So it has the file name, is, which is the URL. It's got what deployment number that, uh, that file uh, came from. It has information about the file size. It has the number of frames. It has whether or not it has a header file, which is important because some of them don't, very few of them, but some of them don't and they're pretty much unusable if they don't have an, a move atom, which is kind of like you can think of as the header. Um, it's got the time stamp in seconds, um, Unix epoch time. And looking at that uh, that pandas data, this is a this comes in. We read it in as a as a pandas uh, data frame. And doing a little some statistics on that, we can see that there's 8,000 files, 227.6 million frames. Um, and then we'll we'll cut down on the number of files just to um, make sure that I do this kind of to make sure that we're not taking certain movie files that are not uh, very uh, that have that have issues. This is kind of a quick way of of cutting of cutting the the, the eight thousand down to about two thousand from deployment two, which is an interesting deployment. And then we'll set up a function that um, that plots the image, and then we'll use uh, IPy widgets to uh, to interact with the data set as a whole. So what the so what IPy widgets do? You, I think you guys have had talks on IPy widgets before, so I'm not going to go too much into them. But IPy widgets give you a way of interacting with um, this here. Is that okay if I do that just for now? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Uh, this gives you a way of inter interacting with um, with with data and um, essentially a way of of applying callbacks to. Uh, to these little sliders here, so that we can look at um, images in uh, in different files. So we can kind of step through and look at uh, individual images that are coming out of the database. So these are being extracted on the fly um, from the uh, from the video camera system uh, from the raw data archive. Um, and so you can kind of flip through and take a look at them. You can look at different files. Um, you can look at uh, different um, different frames. And that's a, a an, an interesting way of, of exploring the data set to kind of get a sense for what's in there. In the next section, we're going to look at, if I pump this down to about there, put that about right, maybe right there. We're going to be in the next notebook. We're going to be looking at imagery that looks like this. So one thing I'm interested in is this material that's in the water column. This stuff is called flock. It's bacterial material that's been uh, flushed out of the hydrothermal system. Um, and the amount of the stuff in the water column changes over time. Um, we don't entirely know why, although we do know that um, anecdotally, after magmatic events, eruptions, um, these this material can um, be very, very dense in the water column. So the thinking is, is that the changes in this material in the water column is a potential reflection of changes in the uh, hydrological system below the seafloor, or some relationship to um, the hydrothermal system. And so I wanted to come up with a way to analyze the changes in this material in the water column. And so we're going to look at that next. And this is the notebook I'm going to spend the most time on. Hopefully we're not pressed for time here because this is a this is a cool and there's a lot here. Um, and, I, and, I, and I was hoping that maybe we could, you know, um, you know, you could you could interrupt me with questions when when you have them because I think um, this is this is uh, it's going to be a little bit complex. So we'll just we'll just read in that uh, database again, for, like we did in the last notebook, right? So we'll just uh, have a list of the files that we want to look at. 
um, we will um, cut them down a little bit and we will just be looking at 1800 uh, files from the data set okay we're going to look at only six images or six frame numbers from this data set this uh, these frames at about 3800 to 4300 those are images that show most of them anyways unless something went wrong shows this scene okay oh so so wait a minute so each frame from each of these uh 1800 uh because this it follows the same path every time you get the same look essentially is that what you're saying um yeah unless something went wrong with the camera and that happens and there's a there's quite a bit of jitter so it's not always so there'll be noise um there we we do we have some um colleagues uh, from apl uh um, have, have uh aaron ha has done some image analysis to figure out where the actual scenes uh scene boundaries are and we do have we do have databases that that can provide that information we're not going to be using it today because it's it's a little too complicated to use but the okay uh, but but for the most part the, the camera is supposed to turn on and kind of do the same routine and so the same the, the same frame numbers should more or less show you that show you what you what you think you're going to see unless something has gone okay wrong. so these six frames from these um 1800 plus sets show something that's sort of like that most of them right yeah okay so we'll define those as the frame numbers. And this is a small number, right? This is only, we're gonna end up with something like, you know, 12,000 frames to process. This is sort of a test, this is a kind of, this is a demo set. Um, it's a lot, it's 20, it's 40 or 50 gigabytes of data. So it's not like an amount that would fit into your memory in most, or most computers, desktop computers. Um, but it's really it's it's still it's still a demo data set, right? Normally it, when I'm when I'm doing stuff, for real, I'm doing, you know, um, dozens or hundreds of frames from every um, from every file, um, and then I'm doing every file rather than just rather than just doing 2,000. I'm doing almost all the all the movies in, that are in the database. So we're gonna it's a it's a relatively large data set, but it's a, it's small enough that we that we can actually work on it here in real time together. So we'll import a few things. Um, we're gonna import delayed from Dask, and we're gonna import um, Dask Array. Those are potentially new for people. And then here's where a lot of the magic in Dask happens. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna loop through every file name, and then I'm gonna, and, and for every file name, I'm gonna get the move atom. The move atom is the header. You can think of it as the, as the header. It's, 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 it's more like a part of the database that tells you where all the frames are. Um, but we're only gonna do that once for every file. And then we're going to embed our function get frame inside of delayed. So this is dask.delayed. And we're going to pass to the function the file name, the frame number, how we want our data to come back. And we're going to pass the move atom, which helps speed things up to already have that with us. Um, and then we're going to we're going to loop through this and we're going to create a list of arrays of dask arrays from delayed objects okay so what we're going to do essentially is we're going to create a list of delayed objects these are like dask delayed objects these are um these are it's sort of like they're the image but they're not really the image it's more like an instruction on how to get the image right so it's kind of like a program on how to get an image and we're going to compile it into a list of those objects and then we're going to stack it all together here using dsa stack the list and to turn into a single delayed frame array okay so this is a this is a dask array this is a dask array it's a, it comes from a stack of delayed objects it has a shape shape is the number of images by the size of the images. It's got a data type for each of the elements of the image of, of the of the array, and it has another thing called the chunk size. So this is this is new if you're if you're familiar with NumPy. 
this is uh, the this is how Dask is going to chunk out the data set when it comes time to do an analysis on it. We've got them chunked out per image, so it's 1980 by 10, uh, sorry, 1080 by 1920 by one is our chunk size. That's one image. And so remember, this this happened really fast, right? That happened in like less than a second. We haven't actually gone out and got the data. We haven't actually processed any data. We just sort of built a kind of, we built an array of functions to get the data. And so this could be millions and millions of images. We could create a delayed frame array from every single image in the data set, and we could do it again in, in a matter of just a few seconds. And we could have 227 million images in an array that is really technically it's not in memory and and those images won't be in memory until something needs those images actually in order to evaluate um, some function or some process yeah maybe it's i mean tim maybe it's just worth saying like you know in the old days i guess you know you would do all this by by uh sort of by hand right you would like chunk out the work so that you could make sure it would fit in memory and maybe you would explicitly send work to specific processors or something like that. And this is all you're just going to do it for you, essentially. That's right. So I don't need to run this, but we'll do it anyways. It's it's the length of this uh, this array is, is 11,310. So we can get one of the frames out of this thing if we want. We'll 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 take the uh, this delayed array and we will um, run compute on it. And when we run compute on it, then it will actually evaluate the elements of the array and bring us back one. So we're going to take one of them, and I chose one that's similar to, to, to this one here. Um, and when we run uh, compute on that element of the array, it will uh, bring back a NumPy array. So we actually have now a frame that's HD size. And then we can plot it just like we plotted the last one. Now it's grayscale now because we we actually asked for uh, we asked for a a grayscale image rather than a color image. And this is the plot. And uh, what we're going to do going forward is we're going to work just on this little area here. It's 1024 by 1024. We're going to crop that out. We're going to do some filtering on it, and then we're going to try to make we're going to figure out how much uh, how much flock is in the water. Or we're going to make a we're going to build what's called a flock proxy or a proxy value of, of the amount of material in the water column um, as we go forward. So we're going to filter it. I, I'm going to use a, a bandpass Butterworth filter um, in order to deal with um, the high the high frequency noise that's in here. And also there's actually low frequency uh, lighting variations. It's kind of hard to tell here, but this this part of the image is much brighter than this part of the image over here. So we're going to we're going to we're going to do two-dimensional uh, Butterworth filtering um, using convolution in the uh, frequency domain. So we'll set up our Butterworth filter. I'll show you what the Butterworth filter looks like. Okay. Um, and then we're going to build what's called a flock proxy function. So we'll just define a frame filter function, which does the filtering. So this brings in a frame. It brings in the Butterworth uh, parameters and then uh, does a convolution in the, in the in the frequency domain and then transforms transforms the image back and then the flock proxy itself this proxy value of that amount of stuff in the water column is just uh, an arbitrary threshold it's the number of pi pixels above an arbitrary threshold um, in this case which is 4,000 so we'll just take a look and see what one actually looks like so if we do a, a, a filter and then do a threshold on the image uh, here, this one here, then it turns out to look like uh, this here. And the number of pixels that are white uh, are 3,313. And that's the flock proxy value right there. Okay, We're going to do that to all 11,000 images. So this is another cool uh, DASP thing that we're, gonna, we're, we're about to do. Hang on. Um, we're going to use uh, a Dask array function called Matplotlux to apply the calc, plot, calc flock proxy function to every element, to every chunk of the delayed frame array. Okay, so we're building here another array. This is another Dask array. You take as input the delayed frame array, a couple of the Butterworth parameters. 
the function. We have to tell it what kind of um, data type is going to come out. It's going to be a 64-bit integer. And we have to tell it that it's not going to be the same size as the delayed frame array. We'll automatically assume Matlox assumes that the what the frame that, the array that comes out is going to be the same size as the frame that goes the, the array that goes in. But that's not the case here. We're going to be um, having we're going to basically come back with just a vector. It's a single number for every single image. So that we're going to have a vector of 11,300 and something uh, long. Okay. Again, it doesn't take any amount of time at all, right? Nothing's actually being done. We're just telling Dask that we want to do this calculation on this array. Things don't happen until you run compute. So here we're going to compute the flock proxy on just 40 of the values. So we'll take flock, the flock proxy array, we'll just take the first 40 um, um, elements or chunks. We'll run compute and we'll see how long that takes. This is before starting a Dask cluster. So this is running to go and get 40 images from the Rutgers server, download them, extract them, filter them, uh, calculate the flock proxy, and then um, put the result into the results. It took about 20 seconds. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's about, you know, so that's not very, that's actually not very fast. <laughs> So that was using no. that was using that was using Dask, but it was just using your single processor or something. That's right. That was not using a cluster, a Dask cluster. So it was okay. it was using uh, just a single uh, core inside the um, inside the uh, uh, inside my notebook um, pod, yeah. basically. Yeah. Yeah. So over here, I'm 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 looking at the pods that are running in the Kubernetes cluster. So this is a Kubernetes cluster that's running on Azure. Um, I will uh, control get notes. It's a it's a, uh, a Dask. That's a sorry, a Kubernetes cluster that has 20, um, 20 nodes. Each of these nodes has four CPUs. Um, I've been I've been I've had this cluster up for um, kind of all day today. I've been working with it. Azure doesn't do auto scaling. Google uh, Cloud Platform does, so it's it's a lot cooler. In this case, what we've done is we've we've gone ahead and we've grown our cluster, our Kubernetes cluster, up to to 20 nodes, and that'll allow us to fit about 70, 75 uh, worker pods inside that uh, inside that cluster. So a lot of times, just to kind of make sure that things are going well and things haven't gone crazy on me, I'll watch the pods that are running inside the cluster. So I'm running a, a cube control command. This is a Kubernetes command to show me the pods that are in the cluster. And here we have running my notebook pod. We have the proxy pod running, which is kind of like the web server for uh, for Jupyter Hub. It's the hub itself, which is responsible for kind of do doling out no notebooks and controlling uh, controlling Jupyter Hub. And then the auto HTTPS uh, pod is responsible for doing the uh, the, the um, the um, um, which we call it the SSL st stuff. Um, but when we start a cluster using Dask Kubernetes, so this is a, this is another uh, another part of Dask. It's called Dask Kubernetes. It's a it's a piece of Dask that can can launch pods inside of a cube cluster. We can ask it to start us up 70 workers inside of our cluster. And that's what will happen now when I run this here. All the pods for uh, for my Dask cluster will now pop up and, and they're all and they're all running here. Okay. So it says we have 70 running. We have 70 basically we have 70 it's like we almost have 70 virtual machines that we're about to start employing. And for this particular problem that's that's a lot because um, because they will not um, because we're going to get bandwidth limited by the by the server and so you know we could have 700 workers or we could have 7,000 workers it's it's not going to make make things any faster because uh, while the while the while the record server will um, respond to more workers faster at a certain point it gets saturated 
So this is so we'll, this is that this is where if you did have the data on the cloud, um, it would help, right? Because you, then you could you could do 700 workers and. I think so. I mean, we haven't really tested that, and I think it depends on what cloud system you're on and how and how they um, how they kind of bandwidth limit the the data in the cloud. It's not clear to me um, how all the different systems work yet. Okay. But my sense is that yes, if if you if you um, if you add it in the right place, in the right in in uh, working in the right way, you could get um, ex extremely high bandwidth of data running through this thing. Yeah. yeah, but seventy is still a lot better than one. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, there, there's not only is there bandwidth stuff, but there are things that the, that the workers were going to have to compute. Right, they're going to have to do that. They're going to have to do that filtering. That filtering is not trivial. Yep. All right, so we, we use this DAS distributed uh, scheduler to um, create a client which we connect to. And then, um, um, and, and now DAS basically knows to use this client whenever it's doing something like compute, right? And we can uh, now, instead of doing just 40 um, uh, images, we'll run through the first 400 images and filter those and, and take a look and see how long that takes. Do you have the dashboard somewhere? I do, but I'm not going to show it yet. Okay. <laughs> it's only going to take 10 seconds. So we did 10 times as many uh, images, and it only took 12 seconds. So it was about we're getting sort of on the order of a maybe 20, 18 or 20 x speed up using a bunch of workers. And we're getting, and we're not getting hit by um, by the by the workers themselves. We're totally we're totally saturating the bandwidth of the worker server. Okay. But let's go ahead and instead of just doing 400, let's do all 11,000, and that'll give us time to watch the the, the scheduler um, um, do its little dance, and we can also have some time to to, to converse because it's going to take about two or three minutes to run. So just to remind you, this is a uncompressed de when it's decompressed. This is a data set of about 44 gigabytes, and we're going to go ahead and just um, calculate the results for the entire data set. As Rich alluded to. DAS gives us this really cool um, dashboard that allows us the opportunity to, to visually watch how the DAS scheduler is, is, is doing its work, how it's doling out um, the processes that it needs to dole out, and um, how much time all the processes are taking. It takes so right a little now, while to building the DAS graph. That's what it's doing right now. It's getting so ready to send. Go ahead. That's being done by one, that's being done by one, by your schedule or by your single processor, right? Yeah. So now what's happening is it's showing me uh, all the processes that are ha happening inside the scheduler. So it's going out for every file and it's getting the move at them. And unfortunately it shows colors that are very similar. The, the colors get chosen randomly and I don't quite understand <laughs> how you, I don't know if there's any way to adjust that, but it goes out and for every file it gets the move at them. It gets the image and it does the flock proxy calculation. And those things are all happening here distributed amongst all these workers, all 70 workers. And it's making sure that no worker has um, any downtime, right? When a worker is done with its data, it takes the data and it transfers us, uh, uh, that information to another worker who's ready to go and then gives it another job. Um, and this is a, this is a nice sort of view for, uh, for, for debugging and for analyzing the process because if you're, you know, if you see a lot of white in this graph as it, as it moves along, you have a, a a DAS problem that might not be um, well uh, formulated, and you might have a lot of workers that are just sitting around waiting for, with nothing to do. So this is a good way of looking to see that you don't have that. If you have a lot of like, if you don't have a lot of white, which in this case we don't, we have a lot of we have a lot of work being done everywhere. Then we have a relatively well formulated problem. No worker is really spending. Um, a lot of time waiting around for the next thing to do. 
Tim, Tim, up at the top, um, how much are these? How much memory are these uh, worker? So the um, maximum amount of memory that each of these workers is using is. Uh, is that? Yeah, when the number of workers gets large, this graph kind of looks kind of funky, and I'm not quite entirely sure why. Yeah. Okay. Over on the workers uh, panel, or is there? Uh... Okay. So yeah, none of these. So none of these is even close to like half a gig. They're just a uh, relatively small amount of memory they're using. Right, each image is about, um, well, it's it's about a half a megabyte compressed. It's probably about five megabytes uncompressed, I think. I don't know. So it's, so it's small. Yeah. So you, you've allotted four gigs to each of these workers, but they're only using about half a gig or less. Yeah, it's possible that I could do this a little bit better. I could I could potentially fit more workers onto a node. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I've noticed though is that since we're bandwidth limited with the Rucker server, um, you know these each one of these nodes has its own um, network device, right? And um, so you could potentially, you know, this, we'd have to do some tests to see, but you know, you could potentially. Uh, uh, saturate a node and then start slowing them down if you try to pack too many workers on a node. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you spread the workers out across nodes, you can get uh, more bandwidth. Right. Okay. I have a, a question kind of related to that, if you have some more time to kill. Um, so are you basically specifying like a certain CPU and memory size for the workers and then Kubernetes distributes those pods amongst the nodes as it sees fit? Right, so inside of uh, the configuration file for the workers, you get to decide how um, how much, uh, what's going on? Anyways, you get to decide how, um, how many threads you're gonna uh, uh, allot to that, uh, to that worker and how many, um, how much of the CPU in terms of um, its percentage of the um, of a single of a single processor you want it to use at the most? How much you want it to get for sure, and how much memory you want to request? So, right. so packing workers into nodes is really sort of um, is kind of defined primarily by this right here. Right. Okay. Right. If I if I drop CPU down to some small number, or if I get rid of it altogether, right? I can actually say that you know that this I can I can say that it's this is non a none value. Then it will pack um, you know hundreds of workers into a single node. And so okay. this kind of game this game of how you pack your workers into a into the physical nodes, which aren't really physical nodes that are virtual machines inside of the cloud is, um, um, you know, it's almost a black art. <laughs> yeah, you got to yeah. you know, do some trial and error to see what what works for your problem. And, and like, like I've already mentioned, you have you have, um, you know, you have network traffic bandwidth limitations as well, which can uh, play a role depending upon what kind of problem you have. So if you're using um, a Kubernetes backend that supports auto scaling, like Google Cloud, uh, Google Container Engine, can you just tell Dask to spin up as many workers as needed until the CPU saturation isn't an issue? Yeah, so you can use so Dask can um, um, so over here in um, when you start your cluster, you can have a you can have a, a, a an adaptive cluster that has a max and a min number of workers. And it will um, it will uh, through some algorithm that I don't know about will uh, in uh, it will add to the number of workers that are available for a problem, and then it will and then it will drop those workers off when they're no longer needed. Cool. All right. Thanks. And the process of 
of, of on the back end of adding nodes if you have a if you have a, a an expandable uh, node pool like Google uh, cl a cloud platform will allow that process actually could take a little while sometimes you know take a couple of minutes to start up another node but like um, once you have that then um, you know if you have a problem that's going to take a really long time it's totally worth you know adding to the to your node pool uh, adding nodes to your node pool and then and then adding workers into that Hey Tim, just a time check. You got uh, three minutes left here. Okay. Well, we should I mean, be we done go, with. Yeah, we can go a little okay. over, but people will start dropping off. Well, let me just show the results here, and then we're done. So we yeah, don't need that. So I'm just going to get a, a timestamp for every frame. This is needed for the plot, and then we'll plot our results here. So we're using a, a hex bin plot or a two-dimensional histogram. It's kind of like a 2D version of a, of, a, of a histogram to show how the flock proxy changes over time over these eight months, right? So the flock proxy value stays kind of low around five, three, three to 500, you know, generally speaking over most of this uh, camera deployment. And then sometime here in June, July, there's a big explosion of flock in the water column. So that's the science. <laughs> We're still trying to understand why that happened. We don't really know, but uh, we just processed, you know, 40, 50 gigabytes of, of image data in the cloud in like a, you know, a matter of a couple of minutes. We moved all this data from Rutgers into the Azure cloud. We did a bunch of uh, work on them from, you know, using a bunch of different workers. And, and then we actually got a scientific result. Now, Tim, you persisted. That, that's, that's very cool. You, you persisted that data onto the, or did you persist the data onto the, all your workers? So if you wanted to do something else, is that data still there or is it, no, you it, have to load I didn't use persist. I'm, uh, I didn't, I, I don't, I don't, um, um, I don't, I don't know about that. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I haven't figured that one out yet. You can t tell me what that does. That would actually keep the data. I, that would keep the yeah. data where? That keeps the data on the nodes. And so like in the canonical case, like if you've taken the mean of all your data, you can yeah. just go take like the maximum value and it comes back really quickly because all that data is still there on your nodes. On your workers, sorry, on your workers. Oh, cool. Well, so I, had, I didn't do that. And I, I, will, I will explore how that, um, what we can do with that. That's kind of cool. I knew yeah. that persist existed, but I didn't know really, I don't know what it does. Yeah, well, it may or may not be useful for this, but that's very cool. That's, yeah, that's, because I mean, right. So if we wanted to run this again, um, say if we wanted to change the, you know, the, um, you know, the, um, the filter parameters, we could do that. We could, we could build a new array very quickly, but then we would have to go out and get all those data again. And I, that's the slow part. So something that addresses that would be interesting to, to explore. So that's pretty much all I have. Is it, does anyone have any other questions? Yeah, folks, you need to unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. All right. Well, um, Tim, oh, yeah, Tim, go ahead. You, Tim, I just wanted to ask you, you uh, all of this you did on the Azure platform, is that right? Yeah, so this is Pangeo running on Azure. And how did you uh, and 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 setting up the account for Azure? You did that basically. Uh, Microsoft has a grant program, is that correct? Yeah, we got a grant of uh, some uh, Azure credits using. Um, they have this AI for Earth thing um, that we applied for and we we got. Um, but you know, if you just want to try it out, you can. Most of these cloud platforms, including Azure, will give you like two or three hundred dollars of cloud computing credits, which goes a long way is actually um, just to play around and try things out. But if you want to really start doing some research, you know, you, you probably end up, you're going to end up needing to get some grants either from Microsoft or Google or, or another funding agency that will provide the computing uh, credits for your research. What I've, what we found in our work with Pangeo is that, is that storage costs can really be high because you know, you're pretty much paying 24/7 for data that you're storing in the cloud, and when you stop paying for data that you're storing in the cloud, they delete it. Right? That's how you stop paying for data in the cloud. However, with compute, you know, you can grow a big cluster 
do some data uh, analysis with it, you know, you can have a hundred vir virtual machines or a thousand virtual machines and run them for, uh, um, you know, 10 minutes or an hour and then shrink up and then shrink your cluster back down and, and get away with paying just a relatively small amount of money to do your job. And so cloud computing and commercial cloud uh, is pretty cost effective when you when you're kind of doing it elastically like that. Storage. Thanks. Not that cheap. So Tim, um, you know, you said auto scaling is not on Azure yet, but um, it's uh, or it's coming. It's coming though, right? It's. Uh, yeah, they're working on it. There's something, but it's but it's kind of buggy. Yeah. The last I checked, it's sort of not ready for prime time. But um, there's there's something. There's something. Yeah, and it's, there is also something for Amazon that. It's not quite as uh, slick as Google, but it's it is also functional. Okay, yeah, I've I've spent the least amount of time really at this point on Amazon, and yeah, uh, yeah so I can't speak to it. But usually, anything that's happening um, in Azure has already happened on Google and Amazon, many long, long before. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Um, one quick other question, Tim. You earlier on, like in your FFT function, where it looks like you were doing a lot of stuff there in that function. That you know, there's probably some other num. There's a, probably some other Python function to do. Yeah, all that stuff in there. Cell 14. Yeah. Uh, there's probably some you know some function that would do that, right? But is that is that or maybe not? But it, I was just wondering if you were doing that because that would keep you in Dask land or something, as opposed to you know something that wouldn't parallelize or something like that. But no, or this is just this is just the the explicit definition of a of a, of a convolution. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure that things like scikit image or even maybe like OpenCV can do this kind of a convolution for you. So you give it the kernel, right? right. So that it best as a kernel, and you and you just say do a convol convolution. Why did I write like this? I have no idea. I mean, I okay. I I probably was just interested in seeing if I could do it. Um, it's I, I don't even know. Okay, so there, there was no uh, explicit real, real read. Okay, yeah. No, I think it would be it would be just as easy and probably smarter and easier to use a use a an image analysis package that gives you the opportunity to put throw at an image any any kernel uh, for filtering you you want and then just do it. Yeah. Okay. And it's probably and it's probably faster than this because <laughs> okay. okay. I mean, well, I don't know. I'm using I'm using NumPy, so. It's, not, it's going to be pretty fast, but um, you know, it yeah. might even be faster. No, there's no reason to be doing it like this for you know if you want to do some filtering. Anything you can do, you know, um, you know, any kind of analysis, any kind of function you want to run, um, can get you know thrown into a Dask array using map blocks. One thing that I've learned that took me a while to figure out is that I had to. Rather than throw, so one of the things that I um, was doing early on was I was actually throwing the filter into uh, into the, the the function, right? So instead of throwing in the parameters, I was actually throwing the filter, and the filter kernel itself is 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 the size of the image. It doesn't need to be, but it is. It's it's 1024 by 1024, and that that just makes it easy for for me in terms of in terms of of doing this math here, but you can, um, but the problem with that is that the Dask um, task graph was basically blowing up because the uh, the filter was, you know, it was 1024 by 1024 and it's a 64 bit um, float, I think. And so it was like an eight megabyte, it's an eight megabyte matrix. And so then that eight megabytes was getting multiplied by the number of frames that I was using in the Dask task graph. And so that was basically blowing up the memory on the notebook server. And so yeah, I so learned maybe, that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so there's well, a few different ways around that. You know, you could, in this case, what I decided to do was instead pass the parameters and inside the function, I built the, the filter kernel. You could, I could make a filter kernel that's smaller, right? The filter kernel does not have to be 1024 by 1024. Can be can be smaller, but this is um, kind of simplifies the math here. 
maybe the uh, big, maybe sort of the lesson learned on, on that, and it, or just something that people would find useful is that even though, you know, Dask does a lot of cool stuff for you, you still have to know something about your data <laughs> and your workflow and, you know, uh, and your memory requirements and things like that to sort of make the best use of it. Um, and, you know, or, or worse, it'll just fail and you'll have to figure out why it's failing and, and fix it the way you did. Yeah, the DAS graphs, the graphs which are basically dictionaries um, kind of that contain all of the, the it's sort of like a way of rewriting the program. And um, if there's big inputs, they can be large. And, and even if they're not, if there's not big um, inputs that are being passed, if they're really, really, really large task graphs, right? Like, um, oh, I closed, I closed it, but. Um, you know, some people have um, graphs with millions and millions of elements. The DAS graph gets very large, and um, there's some discussion underway now within the DAS developer community to figure out how to maybe distribute the process of building the graph. So yeah, there's there are some you know, obviously it's not just. Um, it's not always a total walk in the park. You might you might have to figure something out. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we we should probably wrap this up. Um, thanks Great. again, Tim, so much for um, giving this presentation. It was really cool. Um, you know, I think it's it, as you said in the beginning, a lot of people are jumping onto this Pangeo framework because you can um, you can. It, it's very powerful for doing this kind of uh, processing on the cloud or on your HPC system. And um, it's being deployed in a lot of different places and great discussion going on there, as, as Tim said. Um, so I think we should wrap it up. Um, if you, I can see there's a few diehards have, have hung on here, awesome. Um, if next month for this Tech Dive talk, we don't have anything scheduled yet, but it, I, I guarantee we'll have something cool. Or if you wanna shoot me a uh, topic for what you think would be cool, uh, feel free to do so. So, okay, thanks everybody. Thanks again, Tim. We'll see you next sure, month. Thank you.